one of these trees is the sun. And you can see that the tree, the, the smaller tree, the younger tree has grown in the shadow of the great tree. Hey guys, I'm Harmony Klingenmeyer and welcome to Hope Arises. This show exists to inspire and empower you to hear and steward the voice of the Lord, to cultivate an intimate relationship between you and your Father God so that you know the heartbeat that He is carrying for you. I'm ex so excited to be back with you today. I have a word just burning in my spirit that I want to bring to you all this week. Um, it's a word that I am personally beginning to walk in. Uh, it's a revelation that God is burning and burning in my heart. And I know uh, just by talking to some of the men and women of God uh, that are uh, preaching the gospel, they're all feeling the same thing. Prophets and apostles and pastors uh, that I know personally and that I love are all feeling the same thing, the same pull to the presence of the Lord. And in specific, the Lord has been talking to me about the discipline of solitude. And for a person with my type of personality, uh, for any of you who have done the Enneagram personality test, I'm an eight with a strong side of seven. And the seven is the life of the party, the one who loves to be around others. They're an enthusiast. And that's a huge part of my personality is connection and community and relationship. It means so much to me. And yet, yet in the midst of that, even, even in my personality, it's so amazing to hear God calling me away to the wilderness, to the secret place, to be with him. And so many of the leaders that I know, that I pray with, that I pray for, uh, leaders in my own church and those that I'm connected with around uh, the nation, are all feeling this same pull. God is asking his people to come and be intimately alone with him. And so uh, I, want, I want to start with um, a, a testimony of how God has been revealing himself to me. And it began um, on the first of the year. The Lord really began to speak to me about solitude. And he kept saying to me, daughter, whenever you're with me, there's a third person in the room. And there was a part of my heart that was like, well, what do you mean, God? Like, I spend time in prayer. I talk to you. I share my heart with you. Um, I worship you. I sit down and play the piano and sing songs to you. Uh, I read the word. I'm in the word every single day, twice or three times a day. What do you mean there's a third person in the room? And he began to talk to me about all the tools I use to show him that I love him and yet how underneath those exterior signs of devotion uh, is a fear of being alone with him. He even told me sometimes the piano is a third person in the room. You, you put the piano between us, daughter. That's what he was saying. It's a screen to keep you safe from me. And he began to talk to me about trusting him more deeply, so much that I'm not, would not, no longer be afraid to be completely alone with him. And this one, the, the next one that he began to talk to me about was the Bible. Now, all of you know how de deeply I love the scripture. I am devoted to the word and, and I teach and believe strongly that the scripture is the way that the way that we learn to hear God's voice is by listening to and meditating upon the written word of God 
and it becomes a, a, a standard in our lives to judge the prophetic word and the things that we hear from the spirit. We always look back to the scripture and say, "Does is what I'm hearing aligning with how God has revealed himself in the word? And uh, so when the Lord began to talk to me about um, the Bible being a third person in the room with us, I it, was, it made me a little bit nervous. Um, I, I wondered if I was hearing correctly. But when we go back and we look at the intimate relationship that Jesus had with the Father, we get a really good picture of what God intended. We know that Jesus studied scripture as a child. We know that he had the first five books of the Bible memorized. Um, <clears throat> and we also know that Jesus went away and spent hours in prayer, listening to the intimate voice of his Abba God. And that was what the Lord was telling me. He was, he was saying, my written word is valuable, but it's not me. And you don't worship the Bible, you worship the Trinity. And when we allow this precious book, because, because it is extremely precious, to replace the Trinity and to begin to be uh, the thing that we worship instead of the Lord, it's idolatry. So the Lord began to talk to me about how the word is a journey that we walk. It's like a path, you know, like if you're, you're working your way up a mountain to a beautiful summit where you can see for miles, where you can experience the glory of a perfect sunset. You know, along the way, you don't stop and say, oh, this is good enough. This is the sunset. Oh, it's fine. This is the summit. No, you keep pressing forward on the path until you reach the summit. You know, when people, uh, even, you know, climbing Mount Everest is, is such a great picture of this because the, the people, a person who's working on climbing Mount Everest will go up to a certain point and then they will acclimate themselves to the oxygen at that level and then they'll actually come back down. And then the next time they'll go higher and they'll acclimate themselves to a higher uh, altitude and to a lower concentration of oxygen. And it takes them time. It takes them weeks, months, years to prepare to climb to the top of Mount Everest, but they don't stop preparing. They have their eyes set on the summit. They have their eyes set on the summit. And the entire time as they prepare, what are they longing for? They're longing for the summit. And, and the, the most discouraging thing, the most, the most just heartbreaking part is when a person isn't able. They do the work, they, they, you know, they're fit and they eat a certain way and they exercise and they, they begin this process of becoming acclimated, but they never make it to the summit for whatever reason, for, for, because of weather or because of bodily issues, you know, um, they don't, they never make it to the top of Mount Everest. And the, the crazy thing is, is how many people, how many people start the process but never reach the summit. And this is what I feel the Lord speaking to us right now. Many of us have uh, settled for the exercises. We've settled for the lifestyle of the climb, but we never make the climb. We never reach the summit. We're satisfied with base camp one or base camp two but we never go farther. The Lord began to talk to me about even angelic encounters. And I'll, I'll share a testimony, powerful experience. During this process, after the first of the year, the Lord was talking to me and, and wooing me and, and, and teaching me to come and be with him uh, without the trappings of religion, without the things <laughs> that I so often had brought into his presence, 
without the piano, without the Bible, just the Lord God who created the universe and myself. And one day I was on sitting on the floor of my living room, crying out to the Lord, saying, God, whatever it takes, I want to reach the summit. I'm not satisfied with base camp one. I'm not satisfied with a taste. I'm not satisfied even with other people's experiences as told us in the scripture. I'm not satisfied when I listen to another person preach the word and tell me about their personal encounter. I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied when I read about Paul who walked in the third heavens, who saw things that he was unable to express with human language. I'm not satisfied to know that someone else went there. I'm not satisfied to know that the angels cry holy and the seraphim are burning and the elders are casting down their crowns. I'm not satisfied to see the, even to see the river that flows from the throne of God by which are the trees whose leaves bring the healing of the nations. I'm not satisfied. What I want is your face. I want your face. I want your burning eyes. I want to feel the, 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 even the brush of your hair that is white as wool. I want to be face to face with you like Jesus was with you. And as I was crying out on my living room floor, a, a bright man came into my living room and he what he you know he had the form of a man and and yet I knew he wasn't Jesus I knew I was having an angelic encounter and this angel walked up to me I was sitting on the floor and he he reached down and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said harmony my name is Caleb and I am the angel, your angel, that stands before the face of the Father. And I've been with you since you were a small girl. And he reminded me of a, an angelic encounter I had when I was a little girl. And he told me I was the angel in that encounter. And although I was moved and touched by the presence of this angel sent to minister to me, I turned to Caleb and I said, no offense to you, but I didn't come here for you. I didn't come here to see an angel. I came here for the face of God. I came here to be one with my bridegroom and I'm not satisfied. I didn't come here for you. And Caleb, he just reached out his hand and he pointed at me and he said, that's the right answer. And he turned around and walked out. And in that moment, I knew that I had, I had been tested by the Lord. I had been offered a lesser encounter. And in that moment, I was face to face. It was like I was drawn, you know, like when a, when a movie camera zooms in on the face of, a, of an actor. I was sucked in, zoomed in on the face of the father. And I could see his burning eyes. You know, you'd think if you, you see eyes that are like fire, that it would kind of be spooky or scary. It's not that they're the color, like they're the color red. <laughs> they're the most glorious rainbow of colors. But within every color is the flame of God. And I could feel the white hairs of his head touching my face. And he said, daughter, so many of my children 
are satisfied with the angels. And as soon as they experience an angelic encounter, they stop seeking me. And my heart was so broken. It was so grieved in that moment. I was grieved because I was one of those people who had settled in the past for less than a complete surrender to God's love, to his presence, to his face. And I just asked his forgiveness. God, I'll, I'll never seek the, the lesser again. I just want you. I want you. I want to be alone with you. I want to be alone with you, God. And this, this message, the message that he wanted to be alone with me and the message that I wanted to be alone with him began to resound in my heart. And, you know, as I go about my day, I, my heart is continually turning back to him. I, it's, you know, we, 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 we're busy. We're, we're, we've got things to do. We've got, you know, the, 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 the work of the ministry and the, the, the preaching of the gospel. And even Jesus had things to do. He, he couldn't stay on the mountain in prayer forever. He had to come down off the mountain. He was moved with compassion to come down off the mountain, carrying the heart of the father that he had received in the intimate place. He was, he was moved with compassion to give to others, to pour out on others what he had received in the, in the place of oneness with God. And the Lord, the Lord just began to, to woo me. And he's, I'm still in that process. I'm, I'm in a process where there are times where I'm like, okay, I, I don't know yet. I think I'm, I think there might be a third person in the room right now, you know, like, Lord, what is standing between you and me? Is it shame? Is it fear? Is it unbelief? Whatever it is. And you know, in, in, is it anger? Whatever it is, the Lord is saying, will you allow me? Will you allow me to woo you into the wilderness to be alone with me? And I've been meditating on the second chapter of the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea is so, it's, well, it's got some really powerful things in it. And it's also kind of hard to read. It's painful because Abba God is, um, he says to the prophet Hosea, I want you to marry a prostitute. And the reason he asks Hosea to marry a prostitute was to demonstrate how he had loved his unfaithful wife, Israel. Israel was the unfaithful wife in the story. And so Hosea went and married a prostitute, someone who, who uh, couldn't and wouldn't be faithful to him in order to demonstrate the broken heart of Abba God who longed to be one with his people, Israel. And in the second chapter of Hosea, we see the grieving husband. The first half of the chapter is a picture of a woman very similar to the woman who was caught in adultery. And this is, wow. The Lord is saying to me right now that the woman caught in adultery was a, an, a living example of the second chapter of Hosea. In John chapter 8, where Jesus interacts with the woman who is caught in adultery, it is exactly the same as what God reveals to us about his nature and character in Hosea chapter 2. In the first half, he's like the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who dragged the woman out of her adulterous bed and threw her before the king of all the universe. God is, is, is pointing at Israel and saying she was, she, she forgot me. She thought it was her lovers who cared for her. Verse eight says, she didn't realize it was I who gave 
her everything she has. The grain, the new wine, the olive oil. I even gave her silver and gold, but she gave all my gifts to Baal. Wow. And if you skip down to verse 13, God says, very much like the, the, the Pharisees, the judgment, the justice, the righteousness, the holiness of God. I will punish her for all those times when she burned incense to her images of Baal. We put, she, when she put on her earrings and jewels and went out looking for her lovers, but she forgot all about me, says the Lord. Can you see God's broken heart? The heart of a broken husband who has been abandoned by his, the one desire of his heart, which is his wife. Wow. And then yet, incredibly, we see this powerful shift in verse 14. But then I will win her back once again. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. So powerful. But then I will win her back once again. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her there. I will return her vineyards to her and transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. And she will give herself to me there as she did long ago when she was young, when I freed her from her captivity in Egypt. When that day comes, says the Lord, you will call me my husband instead of calling me my master. O oh, Israel, I will wipe the many names of the Baals from your lips. You could say, it says it earlier in the chapter, I will wipe the names of all your lovers from your lips and you will never mention them again. On that day, I will make a covenant with all the wild animals and the birds of the sky and the animals that scurry along the ground so they will not harm you. It's a place of great safety in the arms, not of a master, but of a husband. I will remove all weapons of war from the land, all swords and bows, so that you can live unafraid in peace and safety. And I will make you my wife forever, showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine, and you will finally know me as the Lord. <sighs> Friends, Abba God is wooing us into the wilderness. You may look around and think, where is everyone? They're all gone. There may be a season of separation, but remember when you stand in a season of separation, it's not a season of separation from something. It's a season of separation to someone. You're being separated to the heart of Abba God. You're being separated to your husband so that you can learn that he's not a slave driver. He is your faithful husband who loves you deeply and wants to heal you. He wants to remove all the things that stand between us and him, whether it's sin or whether it's just less than all he has for us. It's not sin to sit at the piano and worship. It's not sin to read your Bible, but there is more. And the more is the Trinity. The more is his face. Let me pray for you today that you would encounter his face, that you wouldn't settle for base camp one or base camp two, but that you would reach for the summit to see the face of the living God. 
Abba, I'm sorry for when I've settled for less than all of you. I'm sorry when I ran after lovers instead of your love. Daddy God, Abba, Husband, Father, Savior, we love you. And right now we choose you. Right now I speak to every person who is watching this video. And I prophesy to you from the heart of your husband. You are my treasure. You are my wife forever. Father God is saying, you are my chosen. You I have set apart for myself. You I have set apart for the things of, of me, for my purposes for you. And today and in this season, as you feel the season of separation, as I woo you into the wilderness, come with, with open arms. Allow yourself to be drawn by me into the wilderness, to love you, to hold you, to teach you who I am. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm so glad that we got to spend this time together today. It was a powerful time. I feel refreshed. And right now I release to you supernatural hope that you would arise as the adorned bride of Christ. You are beautiful and you are his. And I bless you in Jesus' name. And I hope to see you next week at four o'clock on Tuesdays on the Life Network for Women. Have a wonderful week, friends. Bye-bye.